Okay, so um, I trade here as Amcog Games, and uh, I've been doing games with RiskOS for a couple of years. When I first started using RiskOS, I found it was really good in terms of what I could do with the visual side, the graphics. I found it had some good facilities, but the sound was less so, shall we say. And I think that's equally important to graphics in terms of creating a, a multimedia application, whichever one it might be. And all programs should have some sort of sound element anyway. And at present, you just have the beep on, on Risk OS when it fails. But one of my demos replaces that, for example. So what I've written, because um, I've, I've been doing DSP, Digital Signal Processing, for um, a few years for fun. Uh, and I've written more than one program that does it. And on Risk OS, uh, by the way, I got fed up with PowerPoint. I don't know about you. But I get fed up with slides, and so I've, I've made one instead. Um, so what we have here is an illustration of what this is. If you can't see it, I'll walk closer. I'll zoom in. We have um, integration with BASIC's sound and envelope commands. It has its own operating system APIs too, but I find them quite convenient the way they were designed. Originally, it's very intuitive and easy to use, mostly. Possibly the envelope command might be a stretch. Um, what we have is uh, an improvement to the, the original uh, sound system, so I've tried to build on the thinking behind it. You have 16 sound channels rather than 8. Could theoretically do more, but I put it on that for now. And on the BBC Micro, you had a pulse wave, which could be very narrow or very wide, and that was it. It could make a beat, right? So the Commodore 64 was a popular computer. The person who designed the sound in that was actually a synthesizer engineer. He started out at Ensonic, and it was a proper synthesizer. It was quite an impressive piece of technology, a little noisy. He had limited time, he said, according to interviews. <clears throat> and what I've done is turned it into a 16-channel version of that at this part of the system. So you've got variable pulse wave. So in synthesizer term, they call that pulse wave modulation. And it's a particular sound you'll have heard many times in bits of music and other places. You have um, a saw wave, which is a, a different kind of tone to it. You often have it for strings. And then you have a hollow sounding sort of triangle wave. And then you have the noise. So most modern synthesizers only do like hissing sounds for the noise. This, this modulates like it did used to. So you have rumbles and bangs and all sorts of great fun. Now, because it's a proper synthesizer, um, you, have, you have to you can vary the parameters of the sound. So you can change the frequency, make it vibratos, or make it you know, go up, or step, like you can on the BBC Micro, to make sort of sound effects, things like that, which is, which is novel and interesting, actually, and was, was good fun to do. And like the Commodore 64, you can XOR, or exclusive all the channels together, so you can mix them through a bitwise operation. That creates bell-like tones, or Doctor Who-like science fiction tones. I have to have a go at doing that demo. We can also add the waves together like you could the Commodore 64. So as BBC Micro and Commodore 64 merged together. But further to that, the Korg M1 was a very popular synthesizer uh, made from about 1990, sold a quarter of a million units, and introduced the concept of wavetable synthesis, um, which has been copied many times. And what we have is a digital filter, which is a bit resonant. That means you can go from bright sounding sounds to soft sounds and change the color of the sound, if you like the tone of it. <clears throat> and uh, you can feed the samples into that, so you can take a flute or a piano, and then you can modulate that with the envelope. And so you've got a complete sort of digital synthesizer, both with waveforms, waveforms, or just a very simple thing like playing a sample. So right at the moment, what I would have, what I do in my games, because I've done four games, <clears throat> up until the most recent one, I had to uh, create a sort of like a tracker file, which right, is a sound module thing in a program on a PC, then launch uh, Andrew Timmerman's um, uh, uh, sound module, Tim, Tim Player application, and then play the sound server, which is very clunky. And people on the forums were saying, well, why can't we just play a noise? Why can't we just show the person how it works? In the school or wherever it was. So I've, I've incorporated that easy usability. And similarly with the envelope command, I've explained it and I have examples, so it's hopefully not so mysterious. But it does support all of the parameters of this. Basically. So, yeah, so you've got easy sample playback, you've got wavetable synthesis and a digital synthesizer. All the source code is included with it, as were our examples. Um, that'll be free to download, the current beta of that, um, later on, or tomorrow probably. And it's also on one of my game CDs as well. 
So I'm going to try, not get bit by the demo devil, hopefully nothing will go wrong. Yes, um, it's always entertainment from that. Anyway, so you won't get bored. Um, what you have to do, the module, let's just open up this little obey file here. I'll try and show people what I'm doing. So we've got um, a module which you can load, which I've done, hopefully, uh, so it stores properly. Then you have a basic level of BBC microcompatibility, the trivial stuff. So doing something like I did here, if I do minus 15, I should mention that, oh, to click in the window. I should mention that it has a far wider range than the BBC Micro had. Commodore 64, I think, had about 8 or 10 octaves, and this is similar. So if I just do that, it's just going to make a beep. Not very exciting. Apologise if this gets loud, um, or too quiet, we'll find out in a minute. If I run this example, it'll do a BBC Micro ish sort of sound. Actually, that's a bit boring. Let me try and show you <coughs> the drum loop. There you go. That's done with the sound command. Very exciting drum loop, but it's different. So if we go in there, I show you the program after it sorted its video out. So shift that. You can see that they, they look like BBC Micro Sound commands, but there's a few extra numbers in there. Just to explain, that tells the two tells it it's supposed to be a sample. This tells you which sample to play, that tells you the volume. There are other optional parameters in there as well, and you can simply load them. You've also got things like uh, um, one effect, only one at the moment, which is an echo. So that's just some acoustics to sound. Something quite important, because it doesn't sound natural otherwise. You can also use it that for special effects. I'm going to try and run the BBC one now. Sorry if it sounds a bit harsh. micro used to be able to do. Uh, and that's using the same code that would run on the BBC micro, also more or less the same. And I did that for convenience. But let's say you've also got more elaborate waveforms. Um, I'll just do it from here. Let's see if I can type it. That's the pulse list modulation. That's triangle. It's a chord. Detune oscillators, they're phasing slightly. I can hear it better on the next example. And you can filter to a rumble, which you can't do on BBC Micro, so you're taking out the high harmonics and you're closing the filter. That's a very, very fast digital filter design, so its impact is very low on the system. Um, I'll just show you a looping sample. I've relaxed into one or two of these because they're a little bit intense. <laughs> um, let's try this, looping chord, so peaceful and gentle. Let's play two samples, but then because the oscillators are detuned by default, which you can turn off, Right, you get a sort of nice effect. It sounds like a guitar pedal. There we go. And that carry on for a moment. So you've got quite a lot of things here. The other thing I'll show you is you're going to have the equivalent to PowerPoint, you see, but you have it with sound. <laughs> Too many different sounds to deal with. What we have at the moment, I've got to be careful on this. If I do this, you get a beep. A bit of a different pace of mine because I have more frequencies available, so it's a bit lower. I deny the action, that's quite important. I'm then going to run something which might not be quite road legal, but shows what you can do in principle. Right? I'm going to run the bell, and then I'm going to do it again. So you had a distinctly different sort of sound. You could choose any sound you wanted. The reason why I've done that is because it seems very primitive just having a beat. It's nice to have something which you can customise, and it should really be a feature of the system to do that, to make it a bit more flexible. So, let's see. Uh, yes, I'll show you one or two more things. This is, a, this is the same chord you heard sounding very pleasant earlier, but I'm, it's actually being put through the envelope command. In fact, we'll look at the code briefly, otherwise it's a bit mysterious as to what's going on. Uh, and you have here envelope. Um, when you put it above 128, it then says, I want to use a sample, not a simple waveform, with the envelope command. It then says, I want to use um, sample number one. I want to have the filter halfway closed. I want to, to repeat the effect which is being programmed over and over again in this three-stage envelope. And it says, I want to change the pitch of the sound. I want to do a certain number of steps over the stages, and I want to go um, and decrease them. 
and then we've got what you call what you have on the diagram here. ADSR, you attack, you decay, and you release. And that's what that's that's what I'm showing. So we'll just run that very briefly, and I probably won't play any more of those spells uh, unless David wants me to. You hear that? It's a chord, but it's now stepping down, <laughs> holding and stepping, holding and stepping. That simply illustrates that you can use this for generating original sound effects. So the simplest thing that you can do with it is put. So the bell ringing application, play bells, change the quality which they've got over there, you can change the quality of the bell sounds, you can close the filter, make it brighter, you can put a little bit of echo on it if you wanted to. If you had uh, an application where you wanted to have a particular sound indicating a particular failure, you could do that. Or in the context of a multimedia application, you could have some more elaborate sorts of sounds. So, that's what we have on the um, sound module. Does anyone have any questions on that before we go any further? What does that page 16 or 32 bit sound? It's using shared sound. It's running at 44 kilohertz, 16 bits. At present it requires that system wide. But I'm going to try and do the downscaling and upscaling. But for the time being I've done it that way. So I think digital CD does as well. I understand. But yes, that's, it's running at 16 bit. Any other questions? No, that's okay. If you want to come to me, go ahead. So, at present, the sound command has a basic level of compatibility. My plan is to add compatibility for the envelope command so that you can actually run the BBC micro envelopes. And then, some of the old software we've got for um, you know, the educational stuff, Flax Cottage, for example, which probably doesn't have a sound enabled at present, or some of the old games which have been ported, like Cybertron Mission, will start to work. Um, I have run some of my old software with the basic level of sound we have, and that that came back on. So I guess it not not quite getting there. The important thing for me was to make the new capabilities available because that's what I needed to use. But I, I will do that okay. before I get to full release. It's currently at the first beta. Okay. The sound module we got there is quite an interesting capability. It's distinct to what you have. Uh, available contemporary synthesizers. There are products being sold, and I would love to make something like this. I didn't make this, I promise. I'd be quite impressed if I had. Um, and what, what it does is it, uh, it, uh, it's about 100 pounds, and it gives you like a, a, a fairly like a retro kind of capability. It has a, a 3.5 mil jack, and uh, some controls on the front. But you could put this sound module on a Pi Zero, put it in a box, put a control panel on it, and you'd have a very viable commercial product, I think. But the challenge is, with something like that, is um, producing that cost-effectively, getting your component chain done. You know, stuff I don't have to do in software. The only thing I have to do in software is this, fortunately, which is a lot easier. I have got quite a few things, and I've just hold them up briefly. I hope someone might be interested. <laughs> You've got uh, a compilation of all four games here on a CD for £25. You've got a three-dimensional game. These are all written in basic, all come with source code. The source code can be reused in anything anybody wants to. <laughs> this comes with a 200-page fantasy novel and two quests. You walk around solving puzzles. This is a little bit like a popular game from 20 seven years ago, five years ago, called Lemmings. Um, and it's quite similar, but not the same. And this is a uh, sort of shoot em up type of game. So I've got four I've done so far, within the last two years, slightly under. And I'll briefly show you some of that, assuming nothing goes wrong. I will show you, show you a Xeroid. So I'm going to pop this onto one of the later levels that I usually demonstrate. And then I'm going to try and play it whilst I'm talking to you. They all come with original music, because I'm also a songwriter and musician as well, for fun. That makes you faster. That stops you, usually. Hang on. There you go. That green makes you accelerate. Purple made you jump, so you can go over the gap. To show you, makes you hover. It's just quite important in a minute, because I have to hop over the side. Damage my undercarriage a little bit. if nothing else. I hope the phone with this game, I just enjoy watching it. Uh, but yes, this is all written in BBC Basic. It's just using, I don't know if you ever used it, the Plot 85 Triangle command to work. And the built-in matrix transforms which are implemented in Basic. 
and there are 14 levels, with two levels of difficulty, or source codes included for people to reuse if they want to. These, uh, this is Mop Tops, which is a puzzle game. So little characters that walk about, and you have to guide them out to the exit. Some are, and they're all very different puzzles, and not similar. So kinds of problems. So we'll start that on the first level. There they are. Um, this is a little bit surreal. I was accused of eating cheese by someone and <laughs> having strange dreams. This is an electric fan. Some of the puzzles make more sense, but this is quite funny. The fan blows them across. And then if I can get it in there in time, the spring gives it something to land on. If they don't get something to land on, they die. That's my daughter supplying the, the voice of me. It's more interesting than mine. And then they exit. So all updates are free. If people want something, I usually add it in for people. For example, it's been requested I add a speed up button, but you can accelerate forward and have to wait. So I'm going to add that in the next week or two. Or a few days. Okay, not allergic drills here. You've also got, now I'll see if I can remember the code. This could be failure. No, got it right. A lot of things like sticks of dynamite. I usually get this wrong, and they usually all die. I won't do too much more of this. Here we go. I'm building up with a ladder. And one of them's going to walk up. I'm going to get the rest to fall down. Ah, that didn't quite. Oh well. I don't say things usually go wrong on demonstrations, eventually. I'm going to try again so I can demonstrate a bit more. That's better. I wanted them to do that, to blow up. Right, there we go. And if I give them an electric drill, they can drill their way up. You only have to rescue one, as long as the rest of them die, it's fine. So, uh, if I can find a way to get the rest of them to die, that's probably going to be problematic. But I'll just demonstrate. And you can go up there and unlock the door and so on. It's quite good fun. This is quite a new one. I'm, this is my latest one, actually. Legends of Magic, why not? This comes with a 267-page novel, which I wrote. It's a fantasy novel, which agrees with the story. Usually complains for a minute on this projector if I don't use its preferred resolution. But all my games are an SVGA size because I work just about everything. I've tried to make these as compatible as possible. So you've got a not particularly well drawn man who doesn't walk particularly well, to be honest. But hey, that's actually harder than it sounds to do. You can pick up and examine objects. So you can examine this wand and you can pick it up pick up other objects and there are things, characters wandering about. The idea is you have to get this man to a destination. You have to solve puzzles in order to get there. That's essentially it. You're closing a dimensional door where dark magic is, is bleeding through and causing uh, problems. That's the purpose of that. You can do things like go through this um, portal, press use, transport shoe, and you've got things like an action to drop the shoes down. There are other characters want to bring about, I promise it's not just you. But this this is this has got comes with a map editor and all the rules included as well. It's all completely transparent. There we go. I'll ignore that, you are supposed to be better than user. I'm just gonna go and get killed by someone, hang on. If I go down here, you will encounter the monk. There you go. And he'll electrocute you unless you freeze him with your wand. Hang on. I froze him and I get a bit of respite. <laughs> unless he'll kill me. I think. Well dead. There's, a, there's another one where you can wander around and pick up treasure. Uh, I was sort of thinking of Repton a bit when I wrote it. You also have saves in here so you can save wherever you got to. And I say this is all included. And the map editor requires a res higher resolution than this um, projector was able to do. What I can see, so if I examine that, you can, see it, you can collect all the, all the treasure and um, solve it. So that's, that's that one. And then finally, so it does come with a book. And if I go into the Legends of Magic archive, and we go into the here, there is a book which has 267 pages. Thus, preview. There is 
plenty of pages there, should anyone ever want to read them. <laughs> How far was it gone? Finally then, we have got Overlord somewhere. This is playable in both French and German, because my beta testers were in France and Germany and offered to work uh, translate it for me. So behind the window from the projector is the English version. We have Deutsch and Francais. So we'll play it in English. This comes with about 40 minutes of original music, all available as MP3s. All the games have original music I've composed or composed with my friend, Sim, who also comes up with game ideas and design ideas for me. This has no codes. The <coughs> Zeroid and Mottop games have a code you have to enter to go to future levels. This one doesn't require that. You have got nine missions you can access, and oh, eight so a number of music tracks as well. We'll play it in beginner, because it might go too fast otherwise. I always have a beginner and a master mode, because people always tell me the games are too hard. Otherwise, because I've been developing them, I've got used to it. So things are coming from the center of the screen, and you're traveling into the screen. But this is an unusual design, in that you have no ability to do anything apart from go around the outside. And power ups that give you um, improved weapons, etc. Probably eventually. And there's just off the top of the screen, because the projector's pointing too high, there's a time. <laughs> but you can't see it because it's off the top of the screen. Because I would have a straight I think. But, so, yeah. And if you die, it has um, it has a. Uh... Yeah, there we go. It's definitely off the top. Yeah, you can see the scores at the top as well. Oh, there it is, it's up here. That's handy. Go to mission two briefly. There you go. This one says you have to get through a wormhole to escape past a force wall. Sounds better than it looks. See that? So these are energy things that you can't destroy. You take down your energy show on the bottom right. Which is supposed to power up, which would be a nice one. <coughs> let's play this for a moment. And then let it die. It's random when the wall will turn up or what power ups you get as well. And when you get them. Some sort of power up, I don't know what it is. It's an it? shield energy, I think. And it goes through multiple phases on the levels, typically. So it's basically space invaders, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, I've had people play it right through and come back with positive feedback. So uh, it does play quite well. I'm going to die in a minute, I suspect, because I'm not paying much attention. I was hoping the force wall would turn up. I thought, what power up? It was a smart one that made everything blow up. Yeah, that was a warp power up. I can't see the colour on the monitor. <laughs> Here we go. At some point, if I don't die. Oh, there it is, that's the hole. Oh, I just crashed on the wall. Oh, no, I didn't. Right, now I got the force wall, which is zoomed past. It's all very 1983 in SVGA. I'm going to die, and then you get a suitably dramatic Dire Straits style guitar tune. There you go. And that's actually a full guitar tune, it's not just a few bars, it goes on for about three minutes. And that concludes everything I have to demonstrate. But thanks very much for coming to have a look. Much appreciated. Thank you.